Buon pomeriggio e benvenuti. Good afternoon and welcome everyone to our 2021 Euliano Lecture. I'm Chiara Mazzucchelli, I'm Associate Professor and Dr. Neil Euliano Chair in Italian Studies at the University of Central Florida. I'd like to thank you all for joining us virtually today. And before we start this event in earnest, um, I wanted to give you some notes on how this is going to work. So first of all, all attendees are on mute by default. However, you can join our conversation by typing your questions and your comments in the Q&A box that you see at the bottom of your screen. We have reserved some time at the end of our conversation with our distinguished speaker for today, Dr. Guy Raffa, uh, and I will ask questions on your behalf and also relay some of your comments. Hopefully we will be able to uh, go through most, if not all of them. I also wanted to let you know that this event is being recorded. So if you're not able to stay uh, throughout the duration of the whole conversation, or if you know someone, a friend or a family member who would like to watch this event at a later date, uh, please, it's being recorded. So please feel free to uh, contact me directly at chiara.mazzucchelli at ucf.edu and I will be more than happy to share the link with you. Before I introduce our panelists, a few thanks are in order. First of all, this is our 2021 Euliano lecture. So my first grazie goes to Dr. Neil Euliano and his family for their generous support of the Italian activity of the activities of the Italian program at the University of Central Florida. This uh, event, this lecture, and the 10 before this one, as well as many other activities and great accomplishments would not have been possible without their patronage. So, grazie mille alla famiglia Uliano. I'd also like to thank the Honorable Consul General of Italy in Miami, Cristiano Musillo, for being here with us today to give some remarks. I will tell you a little bit more about Consul Musillo in a few minutes when I introduce him. Uh, to say a few words, but for now, please let me thank those who have helped me a lot uh, to make this event possible behind the scenes. So I would like to say thanks to the chair of the Department of Modern Languages and Literatures, Jerry Smith, and our wonderful staff, especially Pam, Lisa, and Susan. Thanks also to Azela Santana and Heather Gibson from the Dean's office for uh, all their help making this event possible and promoting this event. And now, uh, by the way, of Dean's office, I'd like to introduce to you the Dean of the College of Arts and Humanities at the University of Central Florida, Dean Jeff Moore. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dean Moore. The floor is now yours. Thank you, Chiara. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Through exploration of the humanities, we learn how to think creatively and critically, to reason and to ask questions. In languages, it's very easy to think our studies are focused simply on how to communicate, but the additional value comes in learning why to communicate across cultures. Cultural study is the best way I can think of to teach empathy, self-awareness, and global understanding. And now more than ever, it's critical that we be working toward better cultural understanding and acceptance which is why I'm grateful to the Uliano family and their support of our language and literatures programs. This is the 11th lecture in the Uliano series, and we've hosted distinguished speakers who have talked on topics as diverse as the Italian unification and Italian opera, just to mention a few. Our Italian studies program is flourishing. We've recently started a reciprocal student exchange program with the University of Perugia, which is one of the oldest universities in Italy, founded in 1305. In the past two years, two of our students have been awarded National Italian American Foundation on Campus Fellowships, offering them an all expense paid trip to the NIAF Gala in Washington, DC. For three years in a row now, the Italian program has received funds from the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the international cooperation through the Consulate General of Italy in Miami, allowing us to increase the number of Italian classes we offer. The Italian program has strengthened UCF's relationship with Italian institutions, particularly with the Consulate of Miami. Last year, the Consul General visited UCF to meet with our community of Italian scholars. The Consul then invited Professor Mazzucchelli to Miami to talk with the Ambassador of Italy to the United States, 
about our Italian program and how UCF has benefited from the Giuliano Endowed Gift. I'm very pleased that Consul Mozillo is with us here today, and we're looking forward to building an even stronger partnership with him and his team. The Italian Studies program is a jewel in the college. Through the hard work of Professor Mazzucchelli and her predecessor, Paolo Giordano, and the generous gift from the Giulianos, we can all look forward to even more accomplishments. I hope you enjoy today's talk and thank you all. Thank you so very much, Dean Moore, for uh, your kind words and all of your support. And now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce to you the Honorable Consul General of Italy in Miami, Cristiano Mozillo. Cristiano Mozillo, Consul Mozillo, was appointed to his current position in August 2018, and he has already made a huge difference for the Italian community in his jurisdiction which does not include just Florida, but the whole Southeast region of the United States, as well as some Caribbean islands. Um, I will now tell you about all the incredible work that the consulate has done since the pandemic for Italians um, in the jurisdiction since the pandemic is hit, simply because it goes beyond the scope of this lecture and uh, cultural activities. However, I will tell you that Consul Musillo and his team's cooperation when it comes to uh, Italian language programs has been a game changer for us. And I believe his presence today testifies to this crucial support. So Consul Musillo, a lei la parola. Grazie Chiara, thank you Professor Mazzucchelli for inviting me for these uh, very heartfelt words. It's my great pleasure to come back to the University of Central Florida, even though virtually for this very important yearly event, the Dr. Neil Euliano Lecture. And it is, also, it is also an honor to meet Dean Jeff Moore, whom I'd like to thank for the continued support that UCF demonstrate towards the enhancement of Italian culture among its community. Allow me to emphasize that today's lecture occurs during a special year for Italy, as well as for the United States. This year, in fact, we celebrate the 160 years of diplomatic relations between our two countries. And at the same time, we commemorate worldwide the 700th anniversary of Dante Alighieri's death. Therefore, this lecture, for which I'd like to express my gratitude to Dr. Guy Rafa, will be able to nourish the long lasting relation between our two countries with new lifeblood by going back to the intriguing story of the great poet Dante Alighieri. As you are aware, Dante's story during his life and even his afterlife has been perpetually tied to major historical events. And this legacy has become a common heritage for all mankind. It is Dante's ability to discover new path towards unity and common responsibility that constitutes one of the most fascinating and modern sides of his art. Today's lecture represents the kickoff of Dante 700 in the world, which we have tomorrow the so-called Dante Day, Dante D. I'm delighted that the start of the celebration is held at the University of Central Florida, which is particularly relevant to Italy. And personally, let me say, to myself. When I visited UCF in 2019, I was impressed by its international calling and its teaching paradigm. Italian language and culture are taught in an holistic way, bringing together all the facets of what we call the Italy brand. Furthermore, let me point out that in 2020, during the pandemic, the Italian program at UCF served more than 500 students. And this has been possible thanks to UCF, to the dedication of all the faculty, 
of Italian program and to professionality and enthusiasm of Professor Mazzucchelli, and especially to the generosity of the Euliano family. Let me say that we share the same passion and the same mission, which is to promote the study of Italian culture and to foster partnership between Italy and the US through educational programs. In conclusion, allow me to stress that together we can make a difference. Italy is ready to work with UCF and the Euliano family on further enhancing the presence of Italian culture at UCF, as well as in Central Florida at large, which, which can benefit the students as well as the whole local community. Fatemi terminare con le parole di Dante, con una bella frase che io ricordo sempre. Fatti non foste a vivere come bruti, ma per seguir virtute e conoscenza. Thank you. Grazie mille. Grazie mille, Console Musillo. Uh, grazie mille anche per la chiusa, che è perfetta. Uh, so, as Console Musillo uh, was, uh, was, was saying before, this year marks the 700th anniversary of Dante's death. And last year, the Italian government declared uh, March 25th, which is tomorrow, as Dante Day, Dante D. Uh, Dante is universally known as the father of the Italian language, and it is difficult to overestimate uh, the importance of Dante, of Dante when one considers his influence, his personal influence on the country's language, culture, literature, arts, history, and so on and so forth. So um, I met our speaker, Guy Raffa, a few years ago at an academic conference. Uh, where he presented a work in progress that, um, that was analyzing Dante's graveyard history and cultural legacy. So the seminal paper that he presented at that conference is now a book and I am thrilled that he has agreed to share his expertise with us today. Guy Placido Rafa is professor of Italian studies at the University, University of Texas at Austin. And he's also the author of Dante's Bones, How a Poet Invented Italy, which was published by Harvard University Press last year, 2020. His previous books include Divine Dialectic, Dante and Synchronational Poetry, and The Complete Dante Worlds, A Reader's Guide to the Divine Comedy, which is accompanied by the award-winning Dante World website. He has written essays for popular venues on Dante-related topics ranging from medieval warfare, the abolition of slavery, and marriage equality, to the Mad Men TV series, Dan, Brown in, uh, Dan Brown's Inferno novel, and the movement for racial justice. His current project on Dante's American Afterlife is supported by a public scholars fellowship from the National Endowment for the Humanities. The title of his talk today is Dante's Physical, Political, and Popular Afterlife, Signore Signori, Guy Raffa. Thank you, Chiara Matsukeli, for all you've done to bring this uh, event to fruition. Uh, you obviously have an incredible program at the University of, of Central Florida. Uh, very, very impressive. Um, thank you, Dean Moore, uh, for all the support that you give to the program and to humanities generally. Uh, obviously, a, a model for the rest of the country and many other places as well. Special thanks to you, uh, Consul General Muzillo, for your introductory remarks. I really appreciated the wonderful citation of Dante's Ulysses. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, you have studied in Florence, so I know you have a very special uh, place for Dante in your heart. I'd also like to thank uh, the Uliano family uh, for all their support uh, for the pro Italian program and for events like these. Special thanks to the University of Central Florida Department of Modern Languages and Literatures, the Italian Studies Program, and to everyone in the virtual audience for joining us today. This year of Dante, 2021, as we've just heard, <clears throat> offers a wonderful opportunity to reflect on the medieval Italian poet's life, work, and legacy as we approach the 700th anniversary of his death. Today uh, is an especially favorable moment to do so, 
since it is the eve, as we've heard, of Dante Di, the Dante Day, the time of year in which Dante begins his journey through the afterlife in the Divine Comedy. In my presentation this afternoon, however, I will feature not the spiritual afterlife of the Divine Comedy, but the physical afterlife of the poet who gave the world its most influential vision of life beyond the grave. In honor of Dante, then, I'll start in the middle, in Medias Race, just as he does by beginning his poem, Midway Along the Journey of Our Life, Nel Mezzo del Camino di Nostra Vita. So here we are in Florence, in 1865, the famous Piazza Santa Croce, and this is for an earlier milestone year for Dante, the 600th birthday. Florence is at this time the capital of Italy. We are still several years before Rome, then still under papal control, would become part of the young nation, most of which had been liberated and unified just a few years earlier during the Risorgimento in 1859 1861. This Dante Fest in May 1865, then, is also a celebration of Italy's long sought independence. But Florence had famously, or rather infamously, exiled Dante in 1302, and he spent the last years of his life in Ravenna, where he died and was buried in 1321 hence the 700th anniversary of his death in September of this year, 2021. For its part, Ravenna planned to celebrate Dante's entrance into the world 600 years earlier by renovating and sprucing up the area around the most tangible sign of his departure from the world, his gravesite. On May 27th, a Saturday in 1865, master stonemason Pio Paletti led a work crew excavating part of the original wall of the Braccio Forte Chapel located only 25 or 30 feet away from Dante's mortuary chapel. And this uh, illustration photograph shows Braccio Forte here, where they're doing the excavations. And there's Dante's uh, chapel right there behind it. Before long, so uh, they start to work. And before long, water they're using to wash away dust and debris began to pool at the base of the wall. To drain this water, Folletti brought in a pump. But there wasn't enough room in the narrow confines to operate the pump's long handle. Blocking this mechanical arm were bricks on the outside of the Braccio Forte wall, bricks that were used to cover the doorway that once allowed passage between the chapel and the cemetery behind it. When Folletti dislodged several bricks with his pickaxe, he saw what looked like an entire box or chest. The stonemason, growing more excited by the moment, tried to lift out the box when suddenly its outermost plank snapped off, releasing the contents. The split second it took for the objects to fall into the muddy water at Folletti's feet was enough for him to guess what they were human bones. And here we can see a photograph of the time of our Mason Folletti there with his pickaxe in hand. And this is the wall that he was working on. And there are some bones on the ground. As this reconstructed uh, illustration shows here. Here he's with his assistant, Angelo Draghi. And that's an actual photograph of the wall of the time where this took place. Even before he had time to ask the question, whose bones? The board that broke off spelled out an answer like a sign from above, Dante's Osa, Latin for Dante's bones. The chapel with Dante's tomb was nearby, so Folletti and his assistant Angelo Dradi brought the bones and the wood box there. They made several trips back and forth before all the pieces had been gathered inside the small temple. The full inscription on the board raised intriguing questions about these remains said to belong to Dante. And this is an actual photograph of that board with the words there, and you can see them transcribed below. The note announced that Dante's bones had been seen or viewed again on June 3rd, 1677. But why had anyone looked at them even once, much less again in the 17th century? And who was this person who claimed to have seen Dante's bones and thought to record his viewings on the inside of the bottom of the box? An inscription in the same handwriting on another board, this one facing outward, answered one question while raising new ones. The author, thankfully, this time gave his name. Again, leading with Dante's bones of large capital letters, this inscription says that the bones had been placed here, hic posita, by me, brother Antonio Santi, on the 18th day of October in the year 1677. So we have our man, Antonio Santi, whose fraternal title, frate, or brother, signaled membership in a religious order. With the former convent of the Brothers of St. Francis located right next door to Dante's mausoleum, it wasn't hard to guess which order that was. But besides having been a Franciscan friar, who exactly was this brother Antonio Santi? And why had he placed Dante's bones here, wherever that may be? In the box? In the wall where Filetti accidentally found them? In some other location altogether? And most crucially, what was he doing with Dante's bones in the first place? 
If these bones were authentic, then why, when, and how had they been re removed from Dante's tomb? And by whom? Sometime before June 3rd, 1677. And at some point put in this box. And we can see here uh, very graciously uh, in Ravenna, they uh, sent me this photograph of the actual box put back together. And it's a very small box. Uh, so the bones were kind of just piled in there at the time. And so our detective work begins. There was only one good way to confirm or disprove the conclusion that the bones discovered that morning with Dante's. Look inside the original tomb. Four days later on May 31st, Ravenna City Council granted permission to do just that. Dante's tomb was scheduled to be opened in the presence of a national commission already en route to the city on June 7th, 1865. The great hope, of course, was that it would be found empty. No one wanted to confront a second body with claims to authenticity and have to sort out that mess. But we'll wait to open Dante's tomb. First, we'll rewind to the end of Dante's earthly life, his death and burial in Ravenna in 1321. Dante fell ill, most likely with malarial fever, during a diplomatic mission to Venice on behalf of his host in Ravenna, Guido Novello da Polenta. He died during the night of September 13, 14, 1321. Guido Novello, who had felt the greatest grief at Dante's death, placed his body, quote, adorned with poetic insignia upon a, a funeral bear and had it borne on the shoulders of his most distinguished citizens to the place of the mi friar, minor friars in Ravenna, with such honor as he deemed worthy of such a corpse. Carlo Wostri, a talented artist from Trieste, depicted Dante's funeral procession for the 600th anniversary of his death. I'm putting Boccaccio on this uh, slide here because he's the one who was recording these words from Guido uh, Novello da Polenta. Boccaccio, famous uh, Italian writer, author of the Decameron, is Dante's first biographer. And there's this wonderful uh, painting from uh, 1921 uh, of the funeral scene uh, by Carlo Wostri. Epitaphs written in honor of the dead poet naturally praised Ravenna for providing refuge to Dante in his final years. Praise that often came at the expense of Florence, the city that had exiled him. Ungrateful Florence bore him the bitter fruit of exile, wrote Giovanni del Vigilio, a professor from Bologna, a cruel homeland to her poet, while pious Ravenna rejoices in having gathered him into the bosom of Guido Novello, her eminent ruler. The epitaph that we read today on the front of the tomb six Latin lines in hexameter couplets is no more forgiving of the poet's native city. Here I, Dante, am confined, an exile from my native shores, born of Florence, a mother of little love. These words are attributed today to a friend of the poet Petrarch in Verona. Though the first person voice I sang while roaming, here I, Dante, am confined, led many people to believe that Dante himself had composed it. Either way, a lasting condemnation of Florentine neglect was here etched in stone for all the world to see. Dante's fame was such by the end of the 14th century that Florence took pride in its native son and began the centuries long tradition, one that continues to this very day, of seeking to repatriate the poet's remains. Recalling Dante's bones from exile was one thing, gaining possess possession of them quite another. Stung by Ravenna's refusal to relinquish the relics in response to petitions in 1378, 1396, and 1429, Florence turned up the heat and brought out its big guns. In 1476, with Ravenna now ruled by Venice, Lorenzo de' Medici reached an agreement with Bernardo Bembo, the Venetian ambassador to Florence, for the transfer of Dante's bones from Ravenna to Florence. The deal fell through, however, and Bembo now the Venetian governor of Ravenna, proceeded instead to commission Pietro Lombardo to remodel Dante's tomb in the small chapel housing it in 1483. And it looks very much like it looks today. That's the uh, marble tomb and the sculpted relief of Dante above it. Bembo funded this work himself, as he proudly states in the inscription he had placed on the chapel wall. Less clear is if he authorized the renovations to compensate the Florentines for not getting the desired bones, or if he did it to rub salt in the wound by reinforcing Ravenna's claim to them. Either way, the changes vastly improved the conditions of Dante's funereal abode. As Bembo himself says to the poet, you were lying here, Dante, in a paltry grave, the squalid sight barely making you known to others, but now you rest beneath this marble vault, shining for all with brighter adornment. Exploiting a happy confluence of events at the start of the 16th century, Florence dispensed with polite petitions and turned to power politics to achieve its goal of repatriating Dante's bones. Ravenna was now controlled not by the Venetian Republic, but by Papal Rome. Most promising, the Medici ruler sanctioning and acting on Florentine claims to the poet's remains was not Lorenzo, 
but his son Giovanni, better known as Pope Leo X. You can see here a very famous uh, painting by Raphael of Pope Leo X. All the stars were lying for what Florence had been trying to do for well over a century. Retrieve Dante's bones from the city in which he had died and bury them in his place of birth. The Sacred Academy of the Medici, a group of leading Florentines, wrote at least five letters between 1515 and 1519 aimed at winning Pope Leo's approval for the repatriation. The Florentine pontiff finally took action, no doubt moved by the last letter of October 20, 1519, a formal petition written in a grand solemn style and including among its illustrious signatories, the great Michelangelo, who in his flinty prose tried to sweeten the request by offering his artistic services. I, Michelangelo sculptor, likewise supplicate your holiness, offering to make a worthy tomb for the divine poet in an honorable place in this city. And those of you who know Italian and can see the original can see what I mean by his flinty Italian prose. With Ravenna's rebellious citizens held outside the city, two envoys from Florence's sacred academy, accompanied by the regional president and a team of master masons, were assured of meeting no resistance when they entered Dante's chapel at night. Once inside, they approached the marble tomb ever so quietly, almost like thieves. With considerable effort, the Masons removed the heavy marble cover that Pietro Lombardo had remodeled over 35 years earlier. But when the Florentines peered inside, they saw by the light of candles that they had been beaten to the punch. All the preceding grave robbers had left in the marble sepulcher were a few bone fragments and desiccated laurel leaves. Otherwise, the tomb was empty. A descendant of one of the Florentine signatories to the papal petition cleverly describes this very awkward moment. The eagerly desired translation came to naught, he wrote, because when the two deputies from the academy arrived at the tomb, they found Dante neither in soul nor in body. And it being believed that he had in his lifetime, in body as well as in spirit, made the journey through the inferno, purgatorio, and paradiso, so in death it must now be assumed that in body as well as in spirit he has been received and welcomed into one of those realms. Dante's bones, it turns out, did not travel very far at all from the original tomb in Ravenna, much less to hell, purgatory, or heaven. Following up on the unanticipated discovery of the bones in 1865, and with additional examinations of the tomb in the 1890s and then again in 1921, investigators have been able to reconstruct the crime scene, though a number of crucial questions are and may remain forever unanswered. And I'll just walk us through this. This is a uh, map of the area. This is Dante's uh, little temple, chapel. This is the tomb, the marble tomb, only in the time we're talking about. It's not here. This, this happens later. It's actually oriented 90 degrees counterclockwise. So this wall is actually right on this wall. So the tomb would actually be right over here. And here's the Braccio Forte Chapel we started with. And this is where the bones fell out of the wall. And here's a cemetery right behind that area. And here's a photograph taken from inside the cloisters. Let me go back for a second. This is the cloisters here. Franciscans are here. This is their cloister. And so now they are on the other side of the wall from where the tomb is. And now we're in the cloisters and we've broken through the cloister wall. And you could see here the back of Dante's tomb with the space, several inches, four to six inches there where bricks had been. They just pulled them out. And you might be able to guess why they had to chisel away part of the base of the marble tomb here because one bone was too large to fit in the gap, right? His skull had to be pulled through that area there. We can see a, a cleaner uh, illustration here showing again the gap and the chiseled part of the base. And here's a, a historic photograph showing the actual spot inside the cloisters where all of this happened. So over the next three centuries between 1519 and 1810, we occasionally encounter individuals who, while pretending to believe that the original sarcophagus still holds Dante's remains, know or suspect otherwise. Dante's bones remain hidden, we don't know exactly where, inside the Franciscan convent. Knowledge of their secret location was undoubtedly passed down from one generation to another until, in response to the Napoleonic reforms with the suppression of religious orders, the friars are forced to leave their home. So in 1810 or thereabouts, they likely take the crude wood box in which Brother Antonio Santi had placed the bones in 1677, and they hide it in a wall of the Braccio Forte Chapel. And if we go there today and go by that spot behind the Braccio Forte Chapel, we will see this marble uh, little plaque here with a, a, a words telling us that this is where they found those bones. 
The vis that visitors were in fact venerated an empty grave was confirmed, though not publicly acknowledged, when Cardinal Luigi Valenti Gonzaga decided to fund the construction of a chapel worthy of Dante in 1780. And this is what we more or less see today as well, the outside of the, uh, of the little chapel, the neoclassical temple built by Camilo Morigia between 1780 and 1782. The Cardinal evidently took a peek, and so he knew the bones weren't in the tomb. Found among the convent papers in 1865 was a note saying that after nothing at all was found in the tomb, quote, it was then sealed up again with the cardinal's seal and the whole thing was kept secret. So the tomb remained sealed, as did the lips of those who knew the inconvenient truth that it was empty. By 1818, the Florentines know they have no realistic hope of repatriating the bonds. And so they commissioned Stefano Ricci to sculpt a marble cenotaph, the word means empty tomb, to honor Dante in the church of Santa Croce, which already boasts monumental tombs containing the bones of Michelangelo, Machiavelli, Galileo, and Alfieri. And we can see here uh, the cenotaph by Stefano Ricci that was commissioned in 1818. Uh, the poet Leopardi wrote a very famous canzone about this, and then it's installed in 1830. And here's uh, Byron, the famous uh, English poet who lived just 100 yards or so from the tomb and passed by it every day, wrote a prophecy of Dante in which Dante at the end of his life gets in a final shot or two at Florence when he says, she denied me what was my, my roof, which shall not have what is not hers, my tomb. So clear, clearly when they do get the tomb here, it is an empty tomb by design, the cenotaph. So they know they have no hope of getting the tomb. They, uh, they have uh, Stefano Ricci carve this um, mo monumental empty tomb uh, for Santa Croce. It's unveiled to the public on March 24th, 1830. And now we have two empty tombs, one in Ravenna and one in Florence. So now let's get back to the action where we started. Here we see the Dante Fest in Florence. And this is after the unveiling of Enrico Pazzi's colossal statue. And this was the highlight, May 14th, this was the highlight of those 600th anniversary uh, celebrations of Dante's birth. And the statue was unveiled in the middle of the piazza. Today it's up by the front of the church, but it was in the middle at that time. And in some ways it's a fulfillment of what Giuseppe Mazzini, one of the uh, founding fathers of Italy in the 19th century, had said about Dante in 1841 when he was in England, where he was exiled, speaking to Italian workers, he told them that uh, Italy would be unified in Dante's name one day, and they would erect a statue uh, in Rome to the prophet of the Italian nation. And obviously that does not happen in Rome, it happens here instead in Florence, which is at this point, as I said, the capital of Italy. To prove that the discovered skeleton was indeed Dante's, the original tomb in Ravenna was opened in front of the National Commission on June 7th, 1865. Seating was also provided for the public to witness the event. As workers prepared to remove the cover, all the spectators, hearts thumping, turned their eyes to the tomb. This is what one eyewitness said he and others then saw, felt, and heard, quote, little by little the cover slid off the marble base. And when the tomb was seen emptied of the recently gathered remains, our spirits were filled with an indescribable joy. And the bells of the public tower immediately announced, bringing in celebration, the good news to citizens anxiously awaiting it. A few weeks later, Ravenna proudly held its own celebration of Dante's birth. Over three days, June 24th to June 26th, 1865, the bones, placed carefully at full length upon a white silk bed within a crystal urn, were displayed for public veneration inside the Braccio Forte Chapel. And this is my favorite photograph of the time. And we see here, peering through one of the archways of the Braccio Forte Chapel, there's that crystal urn, and you can see a skeleton there. People are coming from all over Italy and other countries as well to pay their respects uh, to the bones before they are reburied on June uh, 26. When the bones were then returned to their original tomb, Father Giuliani, the priest officiating Dante's reburial, bid a final farewell to the remains, praising the recovery quote as a miracle to justify the prophetic declaration of the hoped for unity and prosperity of Italy. Just as the festivities in Florence for Dante's 600th birthday had doubled as a celebration of Italian liberty and unification, so the ceremonies in Ravenna marking the 600th anniversary of his death in 1921 honored the sacrifice of Italian soldiers and sailors in World War I. In the military procession on September 11th, every division of the Italian army and navy was represented, as were veterans groups and the Association of Mothers and Widows of Fallen Servicemen. General Ugo Sani, a wounded war hero, um, delivered the main address, in which he declared that, quote, 
the most solemn affirmation of the idea of Italy must take place as the people of Romagna and the citizens of, uh, citizens of Ravenna have fully understood at the tomb of the divine poet. As guardian of the nation Dante had envisioned, General Sani added the military had earned the right to honor this beautiful idea of Italy by laying a permanent wreath at the poet's tomb. As we can see here, you can see the wreath in this historic photograph, but then if we went there today, we would see this wreath, which is permanently attached to the pavement uh, right in front of the tomb. And this was a gift from the armed forces in 1921. Two days later, on September 13th, an even larger crowd paid tribute to Dante in the civil ceremonies marking the 600th anniversary of his death, shown here in the photo of a jam-packed piazza in Ravenna. But perhaps the most significant event that the commemorations took place on September 12th, the day between the military and civic celebrations, what was supposed to be a day of rest and recreation. Instead, it was anything but that, as Ravenna was overrun by some 3,000 militant fascists set to attack the property and persons of their enemies, socialists and communists above all. These squadristi, or thugs, perversely sought to spin their violent assault as a righteous act on behalf of Italy by taking a victory lap in front of Dante's mausoleum. The fascist March on Ravenna, as it came to be known, previewed the March on Rome that would bring Mussolini to power the following year. Also boding ill for Italy's future was how Fabio Frassetto and Giuseppe Sergi, the scientific experts charged with examining Dante's remains soon after the commemorations, deduced the poet's extraordinary virility and brain power from the strength of his bones and the size of his cranium. These are photographs of their examination when the bones were exhumed in 1921. Robust and strong, strikingly masculine characteristics, toughness and virility, a very large cranium, intellectual power, masculine temperament. They used these and other loaded terms to fashion Dante into, in their words, the most glorious and authentic representative of the Mediterranean race. A characterization all too simpatico with the machismo and racism at the heart of the fascist regime and embodied by its leader. In fact, Mussolini himself called on Dante to promote his political agenda. In his autobiography, in 1928, he recalls that Dante's centenary in 1921 had moved him to imagine the poet as the prophet of this that fascist fantasy of Italian power. I was dreaming Mussolini wrote in the name of Alighieri, the Italy of tomorrow, both free and rich, all resounding with seas and skies, peopled with her fleets, with the earth everywhere made fruitful by her plows. Mussolini's followers often went to absurd, absurd lengths in claiming Dante's authority to legitimize the regime and lionize their leader. Some fascist apologists even saw in Mussolini the unnamed future savior of Italy that Dante alludes to in the Divine Comedy. From here was a small step to casting the brutal invasion and colonization of Ethiopia in 1935-1936 as a new Italian empire in sync with Dante's imperial political philosophy. Newsreel footage of the inauguration of the Zona Dantesca, the Dante Zone, or the Zone of Silence, created around Dante's chapel in 1936, shows Arrigo Solmi, Mussolini's minister of justice, giving the fascist salute at Dante's tomb. As the narrator reports, fascist Italy has created by the will of the Duce a zone of silence and respect around the tomb of the prophet of the empire and divine poet. You can see Solmi is right here in front in the black shirt and white pants, giving the fascist salute at the tomb. The prize for the most dramatic fascist desecration of Dante, however, goes to Alessandro Pavolini, the fascist Republican Party secretary who created the Brigate Nere, the Black Brigades, a militia that collaborated with the Nazis to fight Italian partisans toward the end of World War II. With the war lost, Pavolini came up with a harebrained idea of assembling a force of some 20,000 fascists in a valley near the Swiss border and having Dante's bones brought there so fascism could go out in a blaze of glory accompanied by the remains of, quote, the greatest symbol of Italianess. Unrealistic on so many levels, the plan became a moot point when Mussolini and his entourage, including Pavolini, were captured while trying to reach the Swiss border and executed on April, April 28, 1945. But even if Pavolini had sent a team of grave robbers to Ravenna to steal Dante's bones, they would have found, as the Florentine envoys had found in 1519, that the tomb was empty. This is because the threat of Dante's bones being blown to smithereens by Anglo-American bombing raids or being looted by the Nazis convinced officials responsible for the tomb to remove the coffin from the marble sepulcher and buried outside under concrete in a thick steel container. And as you can see from this plaque marking the spot, the bones, which always stayed within the, the walnut, uh, the wood casket, they weren't returned to the tomb until well after the end of the war. Dante's physical and cultural afterlives have continued to shape each other as the poet has become a one name global icon. All we have to say is Dante and we know who we're talking about. In 2006, 
a multidisciplinary team of Italian scientists gave the poet a long due makeover in the laboratory. Building on Frasetto's measurements, photographs, and casts of Dante's skull from the early 20th century, scientists worked in the virtual reality lab of the University of Bologna's aerospace engineering department to create the most plausible representation of how Dante looked. They used reverse engineering, 3D modeling, and rapid prototype technology to create a physical model of Dante's skull, including the missing mandible and lower jaw. And then they employed the latest techniques of forensic anthropology, typically used to reconstruct faces of unidentified uh, persons from skeletal remains to model Dante's face, as we see here in their published work uh, of the facial re uh, reconstruction was in the news very much at that time uh, in 2006 and 2007. What fascinates me here are the cultural implications of this new image. We all had our ideas of what Dante looked like, remarked one of the scientists. But if this is right, it shows his face was different. When we finished it, he looked more ordinary, like the guy next door. A documentary on the facial reconstruction ends on an even stronger note. Today, thanks to scientific progress and to modern technology, Dante's finally regained his own aspect, warm and human. Dante's full fleshy face contrasts with the sharp, the sharp harsh profile conventionally imposed on the author of the Divine Comedy. Warm and human, this kinder and gentler Dante is not for Italians only, nor is he just for the spiritually, intellectually, or literarily inclined. The media savvy poet plays to diverse audiences within the global community. As scientists gave Dante a dramatic facelift, Roberto Benigni began reciting and commenting on the Divine Comedy in his one man show, Tutto Dante, All Dante. Beginning in June 2006, he electrified audiences in Italian piazzas and theaters with his riveting recitation of Dante's poetry from memory a canto of the divine comedy in each show, often prefaced by humorous but biting political commentary. Having entertained over a million spectators in Italy, Benigni took Dante on an international tour in 2009, packing houses in over 15 cities. The show was so popular that he returned to Italian venues for a curtain call in 2012, 2013, and millions of fans enjoyed his work uh, tour de four performances on television and on DVD. Dante has been recreated in other contemporary works, not just as warm and human, but as dangerously hot and seductive. The shower scene in the Sex and the City film, based on the popular TV series, made more than a few viewers go weak in the knees. When Carrie Bradshaw wanted to capture her friend's struggle to remain faithful after meeting a gorgeous neighbor with the poet's name, she only had to say, from the minute she met Dante, Samantha was in hell. Giving Dante an erotic charge, clever wordplay confirmed the visual message. Samantha's efforts at monogamy stood no chance. Pairing Carrie's voiceover with Dante's toned, fully exposed body, the filmmakers knew they could count on the audience to get the joke with no explanation needed. Modern sexy Dante is, in his own way, every bit as true to the poet's legacy as the grim, hatchet-faced Dante of traditional iconography, which we see here in Raphael's famous early 16th century portrait, and I'll just let the contrast speak for itself. Among the many other examples I could show in this vein, I'll conclude with one of the most complex Dante-like characters of recent years. Viewers of Matthew Wiener's acclaimed Mad Men television series could find plenty of material in seasons one to five to praise or damn the show as a modern or perhaps postmodern inferno. Don Draper, the protagonist, takes a roller coaster ride through the seven deadly sins and many others besides. But Wiener explicitly tied the show to Dante's poem in the much anticipated premiere of season six in 2013. An early shot shows Don with his new wife, Megan, lounging on a sun-drenched sun Hawaiian beach during their honeymoon. But this earthly paradise is an illusion. The clue is Don's voiceover reciting the first lines of Dante's Inferno in the translation by John Chardy that he holds open in his hands. Midway in our life's journey, I went astray from the straight road and woke to find myself alone in a dark wood. Only at the end of the episode did we learn that it was Don's new lover, his neighbor Sylvia, an Italian-American woman, who introduced him to Dante by giving him the book. Did you read my Dante, she asks, after they made love, Don's body still pressing down on her. It made me think of you, he says softly as he looks into her eyes. And this makes her smile. We've just compared it to Dante's Inferno after all. I don't know how to take that, she teases. Don's explanation after a meaningful pause praises both Dante and the woman he hoped, who hopes the poem will deepen their intimacy. It's beautiful, he says. But we know that Dante's beautiful verses, like the historical moment in which Don reads them, reveal not just love, but also depravity, deception, violence, and treachery. America at the end of 1967 is ravished by devastating social ills and is reeling from the carnage of the Vietnam War. 
as the nation is about to implode with protests, riots, and assassinations, Don Draper, who has relapsed into infidelity, remains stuck in his existential dark wood. In his commentary on the episode, Wiener said that he wanted the audience to, quote, feel like Don is in some kind of afterlife, that he's going through some kind of test, being tested. I think it's fair to say that this may be an understatement for what so many of us are experiencing today. A devastating global health crisis, alarming political violence, persistent racial injustice, and growing economic inequality are high on the list of daunting challenges that make Dante that much more illuminating and it seems to me that much more relevant in 2021. I'm convinced that this medieval Italian poet matters not only when we praise or agree with him, but also and especially when we challenge and talk back to him. Dante is most at home, not in a monumental tomb or in a museum, but in classrooms and in piazzas and in conversations like the one I look forward to having with you right now. Grazie, thank you so much for listening and for watching. So thank you very much, Guy. Thank you for this riveting talk. The, the topic per se, the, the story per se is fascinating, but the way you, uh, you tell it both on Zoom and on paper, actually, it's just so intriguing. And by the way, your paper, I know you're not going to promote your book, but I will do it for you. So I invite everyone to get a copy of Guy Rafa's Dante's Bones, and I guarantee that you will be glad you did. Um, and also, you know, tying uh, Dante to the Mad Men series, tying Dante to uh, Sex in the City, that's evidence that Dante is still relevant, relevant, very much so, 700 years after his death. This is why we're here together. You know, we're not a bunch of lunatics for celebrating, you know, the 700th anniversary, and especially to the, for declaring Dante Day, you know? So um, I would like to ask you a few questions. The first question is your project. How did you think of it? How did you come to it? When did it, you know, start interest you in the first place? How did it all start? Thank you, Kat, and thank you for those very kind words about the book. I, you know, I, um, it, it was a long project. I, I started it probably 10, 11 years ago. Um, I guess professionally, the beginning was uh, when I read in newspapers, I think it was 1999, that a relic had been found in the National Library in Florence, Dante Dust, they called it. Right. And uh, there was a lot of controversy over this. And um, it sort of, it got me interested in sort of how this relic had come to Florence, something that had actually uh, been found in 1865. And so that's how I, I learned about the, the story a little bit. Um, but of course, the journalists only had bits and pieces of it. It wasn't a story that had been fully told. And so I thought, well, this would be some, something that would be a lot of fun to sort of go back and find out more about. Uh, and so that was the professional part. The personal part is um, I've always been fascinated with, um, with tombs, with memorials, uh, with the connections between the living and the dead, I guess. And so um, probably why I'm a Dante scholar and teacher to begin with, uh, but this particular uh, project really uh, gave me an opportunity to explore sort of what those, what those kinds of things mean. My very first visual memory, and I'm, I'm dating myself here, uh, is in 1963, as a three-year-old boy watching on television, the uh, funeral procession of President John F. Kennedy, who had just been assassinated, and the very famous image of his young son, John John, who was, like me, three years old, saluting his father's flag-draped casket. That's kind of an iconic image, but it's my very first uh, visual memory. And so I've always been interested in those, uh, those moments and those connections, and this project was a wonderful way to explore it. I, I never imagined it would get so big and, and, and have so many different uh, directions within it, um, but uh, but it's one that I'm really glad that I took the time to sort of work on. Okay, so we have other questions. Um, one of the question is: Is the book translated in other languages, especially in Italian? So I know the book is recent, but tell us a little bit, you know, about your plans. I, I would love for it to be translated in Italian, and I think the press is looking into it. We have a couple of possibilities. If anybody out there is uh, knows something else, I pass it on. I will pass it on to the editors at Harvard. Um, but uh, I hope is that that will happen. And I know uh, some uh, a German uh, scholar has been in touch uh, with me and with the press and would, would like it very much to be published in German as well. So uh, we're hoping down the road. But it is, it is a fairly recent book. It came out in May of 2020. Uh, and so, you know, it's still in its, its first year, so to speak. 
Um, and so we'll see what happens. But I, I, I do hope that, yeah, within yeah. maybe not too long that we have at least an Italian translation. That's wonderful. Something else. So thank you for the fantastic presentation. What did you find most surprising during your research? And that's a great question. And it's, it's one that I really love to think about. There were so many things, but to give you one example, um, you know, I had to assemble many different bits and pieces uh, of the story. And, um, and many of them were already published. But one day I was in the New York Public Library looking at microfilm uh, for the information just on, the, on the, uh, the 600th anniversary in Florence. And I did one of the things we often do. I, I was very silly in how I was controlling the machine and I went too far and it went into the next month. And there I see a picture, it looked like of, of sort of the tomb and some things going on. And so I basically discovered that the father of one of the engineers who was there on site when the bones were found had written to the Italian newspaper, Lo Servatore Romano, is what I was looking okay. at, the mm -hmm. famous Italian paper. And the father had written these long letters and he was including all this information that his son, Filippo Lanciani, who's a, a, an engineer and is a character in my book, had told his father about. And this was just a day or two after the discovery. And so I had all this new information uh, and, and eyewitness information about what it was like. And throughout the book, I think what I enjoyed most was finding these eyewitness accounts, the people who were there on the scene, on site, and including their, their voices, some of, uh, some of whom I included in the talk today. So that was a really wonderful surprise. Just quickly, another one was when I was on the Council of the Dante Society of America, and we were meeting, as we often did, in, in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, in Longfellow House, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, the first really big translator of Dante in the 19th century. Uh, I learned that there were fragments of that wood box in Longfellow's possession. He considered them a relic. He had been given them as a gift from the American consul to Florence who had, had gotten them from Florence and brought them back to the United States. And so we actually have here in, uh, in the United States in Cambridge, Massachusetts, some bits and pieces of Dante's physical afterlife in the form of the wood box in which the bones were found. Uh, and so that was a great surprise as well. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Another question. So do you plan to continue on this research and subject? Is there still a lot to discover or unveil? That, that too is, is something I think about. And you know, it, I, don't, I don't know what's going to happen in, in 2021 because of the virus and everything else that's taken place. But at least last summer in 2020, a team of scientists uh, from the University of Bologna uh, mm -hmm. had already begun to sort of prepare to do some examination of the bones. And so they were doing some things from outside the tomb, obviously, but the science is so much more sophisticated today than it was in 1921. Mm -hmm. And so I, I know they were hoping and planning to do some more uh, work. And so whatever they find there will obviously shed new light on the story of the remains. The other thing is going back to the beginning of the project with the, that Dante dust, there were these little relics uh, that ended up in different places. One of them is in the uh, Senate library in Rome, for example, there's a, uh, there's a jeweled locket and that in, uh, contains some of this Dante dust. These are scrapings that they took from the site where his bones were uh, examined by the doctors. And three or four of these other ones are mentioned early in the, in the 20th century, but we don't know what happened to that. So there was still some mystery about some of these relics that came legitimately from the uh, funeral, uh, from the gravesite and where they've ended up. So those are avenues that if I don't end up uh, going down them, I hope somebody else sort of picks up the, uh, the torch and, and, and sheds more light on the, on the graveyard I history. I think some private people, some private buyers could have gotten a hold of them. Buyers, but also, um, again, also people, it, it turns out, I write about this a lot in the book, there was a little bit of a conspiracy. There was an inside job, so to speak. There were, uh, there were Florentines, but there were also people in Ravenna who sort of worked with the Florentines to sort of get them some of these relative, relics to sort of come out of Ravenna. And there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of um, uh, tension between the two cities. And at one point, there was even a mob that, uh, that probably would have harmed uh, some of the Florentine deputies in Ravenna if they left the city with these Dante uh, mementos or these Dante relics. Um, so sometimes uh, private people, but often people who are connected actually with the government or with the, uh, the library in Florence, uh, other places that had some access, the VIPs who had some access to the scene. But then the one that we end up, ended up getting in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts just came from one of the stonemasons. He just decided to pocket a few of the pieces of wood and then he, uh, he then he sold them he sold them to a uh, an antiquarian who then gave them to the American Council etc. So it was a mixture of private and professional. Okay, we have another question. Does Dante have any known descendants? And 
if you know them, are they involved in any of the research or his legacy? So I guess, yeah, I, I think on, on, on the side of one of his sons, again, the female branch, uh, there is sort of still a, a line that sort of goes back to Dante. Uh, and they, they have a vineyard, actually a very famous wine sort of comes out of, uh, out of their family. And they are actually, in, in my story a little bit, they are often participating in some of these processions, some of these commemorative events. They would always invite a member of this line, branch of the family uh, to sort of come into play and at least kind of give some authenticity uh, to it. Uh, so yes, they have been in it. I think one was in the news not too long ago because uh, there was some new information uh, that was found, but, uh, but so they are, they are still, still around. Okay. Well, Guy, thank you so much. Uh, I believe that this concludes our webinar for today. So let me tell you something that, well, as you know better than me, uh, Dante was known for being pretty self-confident, even a bit arrogant, maybe. <laughs> But I bet that even he would be pleasantly surprised by the turnout at a virtual event held in English on him in a faraway place called Florida, 700 years after his death. So thank you so much, Guy Rafa, and thank you all for joining us today for the 2021 Euliano Lecture. I hope to see you all again um, at our next lecture in this series. Grazie. E arrivederci. Grazie.